here. Um, welcome to workshop two, COVID tracking, transmission detection, and modeling. Uh, my name is Daruk Kumun. I will be your chairperson for the first sessions. Sessions one, tracking transmission. If you have any questions, please feel free to write in uh, the chat box. Um, please welcome Peter New Yand from Harvard University, our um, keynote speakers. Hi everyone, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into it and, and get started. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for inviting me and being here. Um, and let's see. And today, uh, so I'm a research scientist at the Wies Institute. It's Harvard's Bioengineering Institute. And today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our work that was recently published and it's focused on uh, face mask point of care detection for COVID-19. So can we, can we make a point of care system um, that's integrated into a face mask um, and can give you results uh, as sensitive as an RT-PCR test? Um, so that's kind of the thesis of what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm really excited to share um, our work. So I'm also part of the contingent for the James Collins Laboratory. If you guys don't know, uh, Professor James Collins is at MIT, and the focus of our lab is on synthetic biology. Um, and that's something that we're, we've been, we pioneered for the past couple of decades. Um, in the past couple of years, uh, what we've been really been focused on is this concept of trying to integrate synthetic biology, you know, which is the technology that you always think of for the laboratory because you need to, to do liquid handling, right? Uh, we're trying to integrate synthetic biology with wearables technology, which is, you know, a solid state technology typically because um, you typically wear dry clothes. Um, and so it's these two incongruous technologies that we're trying to integrate uh, together. And this COVID-19 mask was actually born out of this technology, uh, th this kind of meshing of, of these two technologies. Um, and what we have done uh, is we've created this synthetic biology wearable and it's, it's a whole suite of different uh, sensors and different technologies that you can wear and the COVID-19 part is a small portion of that so it's about I'd say 10 to 15 percent of the total work I'll link the actual paper that we published including that includes the COVID-19 mask at the very end of this um, and so the kind of the, the, the core of how the synthetic biology is able to get integrated into wearables is we're able to use freeze-dried cell-free reactions. Um, so we can take biological reactions, think, uh, think simply of cell-free reactions as something similar to a PCR reaction, right? But in this case, not only can you amplify DNA, but you can also do transcription and translation in these reactions. And so you can have really complicated synthetic biology uh, reactions, sensors, bioproduction, and you can actually freeze dry that in directly into fabrics. Um, and so that's the general uh, platform that we engineered. Um, and so you take these cell-free reactions, you freeze dry them into the fabric, um, and now you have a wearable platform where if you add water back into the system, the water rehydrates those freeze-dried cell-free reactions. The entire circuit gets uh, rehydrated and activated again, and it happens as if you know you you froze it yesterday. Um, so these uh, freeze-dried reactions are self uh, are shelf stable, uh, so you can store them at room temperature. Um, and as soon as you add the water back in, it the the reaction occurs uh, at room temperature as well. And you can have uh, sensing reactions that sense something in the water such as a toxin or or even in our case a virus um, and gives you some kind of output a fluorescent output or a color metric output and so this is a broad uh, a generalization of the the technology that we use to make the wearables uh device and while we were doing this and trying to wrap up this publication COVID 19 happened okay 
And so at that point, this was around spring of 2020, we were wondering how we could apply our technology to what was going on around us. The laboratory was shut down and we were trying to think about, you know, how can we um, develop our technology for COVID-19? Um, and this kind of struck us is, is this statement by uh, Deborah Burks, then the White House coordinator for the COVID-19 response. And she said, and this is in, in relation to nucleic acid tests, there will never be the ability to do a test on you know, 300 million plus people a day or to test everyone before they go to work or school or when they even come home from work or school. And that really uh, demonstrated the limitations of nucleic acid technology, nucleic acid amplification test, which is the gold standard for uh, detecting COVID-19 uh, because you're actually detecting the, the, the nucleic acid signature, right? And we wondered whether we could take our freeze-dried wearable system and instead of detecting some kind of external threat, which we had been doing before, can we use that to make a diagnostic? Okay. So, um, you know, we did develop this. Uh, and what we basically want to do was short circuit this, the common chain of what goes on for RT PCR uh, nucleic acid amplification testing, where you have sample collection, which kind of happens in a laboratory, uh, sorry, in, in a hospital or clinical setting. Uh, because it has to go to a laboratory, you batch them, you have to wait until you have enough samples. Then it gets sent over to a laboratory where you do the laboratory analysis in large instruments. Can we eliminate all of this um, and have the sample collection and the detection happen at the point of care uh, without this uh, need for a, a heady infrastructure? Uh, and sometimes this whole process might take a day, sometimes it might take 72 hours to a week, uh, depending on the availability of the tests. And so what we developed was a face mask that can, detel that can detect COVID-19 uh, directly on the face mask. And here are the parameters for the face mask that, that, that we set for ourselves. One is we want it to be non-invasive. Um, so we're directly detecting the virus from the breath of the patient. Um, so that's the first thing. So the face mask now has double duty. It, it prevents transmission of the viral the virus from aerosols. And it's also by preventing that transmission, it's accumulating sample that's being tested. Um, the second thing is we want it to be simplified. So it has no electronics or no power. So that is, there's no actual instrumentation needed that might complicate a point of care device, right? The third thing and kind of the most important thing is it has to be sensitive. It's, it has to be comparable to RT-PCR in terms of sensitivity. Uh, the fourth thing is we decided to use CRISPR-based technology, and this allows us to do nucleic acid sensing. Um, and also uh, an added benefit of that is it's programmable. You, all you have to do is swap out the gRNA, and it goes from a COVID-19 test to a influenza test, for example. It's, it's that easy to swap. Um, and to continue, we have developed a point of care solution that gives you a 90 minute result. Uh, it can be faster. We have a range and this is the, the maximum range. Uh, we've gotten results within 30 to 45 minutes, um, but the, the longest it's taken is 90 minutes. It's lightweight. It weighs a, as much as a pack of uh, gum. So it's about one gram. You hardly notice it when it's on the mask. It's shelf stable, again, because it's freeze dried. The, the entire reaction is freeze dried into the face mask. It's stable at room temperature. You don't need a cold chain to move it around across the ocean to another country, for example, or to store it. Uh, you can store it on the shelf at room temperature. And it's relatively inexpensive. The add on cost is about $5 in the United States. Um, and so just to kind of walk through how it works, um, this is one of our first generation masks. You can see on the outside, on the left, what it looks like, and as well as on the inside, uh, what it looks like. And we're gonna walk through to see how it works, okay? So you can imagine, this is what it looks like on the inside. Imagine the patient is wearing this mask and you have all of these components. You have a water reservoir that contains the water. You have the sample collection zone in the middle. That's actually what's collecting all of the aerosols while you're breathing or talking. Um, and then you have the kind of the engine of the, the sensor itself, which is these freeze-dried reactions uh, in a micropad 
I'll explain what that is. And then an output, which is a lateral flow strip to the outside of the mask. Um, and if we look at a diagram of this, imagine that the patient is now wearing this mask and you have aerosol collection. From our calculations, we calculate that you'll need about 15 to 20 minutes to get the, the sufficient number of copies based on um, viral load that people have tested for what's in uh, a, an average human breath. And again, these figures are from the wild type virus, not the Delta variant. Um, and so it should be a lot less with the Delta variant. Um, so you wear it for 15 to 20 minutes, aerosols accumulate on the sample collection pad. Um, and then when you're ready, you actually activate, the only thing that the user has to do is activate that sample reservoir. And when you puncture that sample reservoir, what it does is it allows the, the liquid from the blister or from the reservoir into the sample pad. And so now everything is, is driven by capillary flow. The capillary flow pushes the, uh, any accumulated viruses through the sample pad into our micro pad where you have the sensor. And we'll go into the details of that in a bit. After the, the micro pad sensor processing, which is what happens for about 30 minutes, then it goes into a lateral flow assay where you have a colorimetric readout. Um, and you get basically a couple of bands, uh, two bands uh, if you're uh, not, if you have a negative result, one band if you have a positive result. And so you go from a nucleic acid test uh, to a direct uh, visual output here, okay? And if we break down each of the components, you can see here, we took each of the components and laid them out. You have the water reservoir, the sample collection area. The micro pad is this accordion system where each of the little uh, white areas you see here is actually a porous area. Um, and you can actually put reactions on them and freeze dry them. And so you basically have a reaction that is in sequence um, with a, a time delay in between each reaction, okay? And so you fold that up into a stacked uh, system and then you tape it together. And at the very end, you have your ladder flow assay output, okay? And these are all modular systems, uh, all modular components here. Um, and here is a diagram of what it looks like. You can see for each of the, in the middle here, you have your uh, micro pad and you have different reactions here. You have a lysis reaction, you have an RTRPA reaction, which amplifies the nucleic acid, and you have a Sherlock, which is the Cas12A reaction. And all of these are seamlessly uh, kind of welded together so that uh, the water where it's flowing through capillary flow goes from each reaction to another and finally to the lateral flow out assay output. And this is what kind of what the reactions look like in detail. You have a lysis reaction, which lyses and uh, liberates the SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Then you have the RT-RPA, which generates uh, double-stranded DNA from the RNA genome. And then finally, you have the actual nucleic acid detection system, which is Cas12A CRISPR-based. And all of these steps occur at ambient temperatures. That's something we worked a very long time on. Uh, it's integrated into the system. So everything here is working at room temperature, at one temperature, um, doesn't need thermal cycling. And there's no user intervention needed after activation. There's a series of time delays between each of these steps that allows each of these steps to incubate at the optimal time. Um, and we're detecting uh, the S gene, which is the spike gene for SARS-CoV-2. Again, this is for the, the wild type uh, virus. And here's some of the data that we had uh, from this system, from our prototype system. You can see here, we're looking at the sensor sensitivity and we're looking at the test line, uh, which is on kind of the, the left, right-hand side to the control line. So we're looking at the TC ratio what is what it's called. And you can see we're looking at the total numbers of target, total numbers of viral uh, RNA. Uh, so this is a contrived sample that we can detect. And you can see here the sensitivity drops off right at around uh, 1,000 to 100 copies. So right around there is the lowest sensitivity we can detect. Um, and the red line I'm showing here is our limited detection for the system. Um, and so that is right around the same sensitivity as RT-PCR for the WHO approved assays for COVID-19. 
And you can see, so it's very sensitive. You can detect uh, at least down to, I'd say mid hundred uh, copies. And we also demonstrate that it's specific for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, and we use the same uh, gene where we took the gene from different circulating human coronaviruses. And as you can see here, uh, we have the specificity, uh, and this is due to the CRISPR-based detection method. It's, it's, if you use CRISPR to detect something, it's very sensitive for that particular nucleic acid signature. And we see that here for our system as well. Um, and again, on the right is what the lateral flow assay would look like. You have two bands for the negative result and one band for your SARS-CoV-2 result. Um, so we have uh, sensitivity and specificity. All of the results I'm showing here are in vitro results. So these are face masks that we have on the bench where we're exposing it to uh, samples that were contrived. Um, and the reviewers want us to do, go one step more. And so we uh, developed this breathing simulator. Um, at that time, it was a kind of difficult for us to uh, develop the system and uh, get approval for clinical trials, just because at that time, this was uh, actually late spring of 2020. And so it was, we, we were right in the peak of the first wave of the pandemic. Um, and so what we did instead was we, we generated, we, we built this breathing simulator that has a breathing generator. It has a nebulizer, which generates aerosols at the same uh, diameter as typical human uh, aerosols are generated at when you breathe. Um, and that those aerosols are pumped through a heat sleeve and through an anatomically precise mannequin. Um, and so this whole system took us uh, about a, uh, two months to put together uh, through the generous donation from uh, a number of companies that helped us on this. So again, this is showing the samples uh, that we have, the RNA samples, getting uh, pipetted into the aerosolizer. Um, and those are the generated aerosols that are pumped through the system. Um, and this is what the, the, uh, the whole assembly looks like. Um, it looks, you know, uh, a bit crazy, but it, it works beautifully. Uh, we think it's actually kind of the most uh, accurate breathing simulator that was available at that time that we cobbled together. And we put the mask on the whole system and tested the sensitivity and we got roughly the same sensitivity that we had uh, before. Um, and so these are looking at copies of RNA that are pumped through this entire system that simulates human breathing. Um, and um, this demonstrates that at least for a breathing uh, simulation, it gives us a similar result to what we had to in vitro uh, results. Um, so uh, I'm showing you just a really quick snapshot, uh, just do the time limitations here, of uh, our system. And our system is essentially an instrument-free RT-RPA, Cas12A, CRISPR sensor, for COVID-2 detection in aerosol samples from human breath. Um, and again, the, the, the key points here are no power, uh, no human handling needed other than pressing a button on the mask to activate it, um, room temperature storage and operation. So greatly simplifying uh, you know, uh, distribution and storage. And the operational complexity, again, we, we reduce that to just the press of a button. Um, and the next steps for this, for the since this was published in the summer, we've been working on trying to commercialize this. We're looking at design optimization. Um, designing this for manufacturability is a big thing right now. Uh, how do we get this into, uh, if, into production? Nobody's really built something like this before. And of course, we, we want to move into clinical studies to see uh, if this will work in an actual human setting where you have a breathing person wearing the mask, of course, with all of the nuances of a human being uh, using a wearable um, and seeing if it works, uh, performs just as well as the laboratory. And with that, I'm going to close it and uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, and uh, that QR code here on the right is a link to our paper. Uh, the title's up there, Wearable Materials with Embedded Synthetic Biology Sensors for Biomolecule Detection. Please check it out. 
the, uh, the, the paper itself was just officially published this month. So it's in the, the, the November issue of Nature Biotechnology. We made the cover of it. Um, and so that's what the cover looks like. Um, these are all the, the fantastic people that worked on the project on the left. And of course, are all of our sponsors uh, that funded the project on the bottom. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, jump back on for questions. If you guys have any questions. I see a couple of questions here. Can this technology be used for other airborne illnesses as well? Um, so yes, it can. Um, so you, as you can see, um, if we use a, the, the CRISPR-based method. And all you need to do is develop uh, a sufficient gRNA for another uh, respiratory virus. Um, and you know, initially when we developed this face mask, we were focused on uh, the fall of 2020, and the the idea there, because this this whole I, this whole concept was developed through talking to physicians. We have physicians in our laboratory that were then uh, working in COVID-19 wards, and and through talking with them, we were like, okay, you know, can we develop COVID-19 mask for the fall, where if you had influenza or COVID-19, this mask would be able to differentiate the, between the two. So that you can get triaged for COVID-19 um, appropriately. Um, fortunately, what happened in the fall was, you know, as, as everybody knows, we had the lowest uh, influenza rate globally that we've seen in, in, in a very long time. Um, but we uh, we did test it for other uh, respiratory, not respiratory viruses, but other systems, uh, just by swapping out the gRNA. Um, and so we've also had a lot of interest in developing this for TB, uh, for tuberculosis. And that is something that we're, we're trying to pursue right now. Uh, second question, timeline for commercialization. Right now, the, the biggest issue is uh, just getting this funded uh, for commercialization, getting that seed funding. Uh, surprisingly, everybody's excited about the, the technology, but we don't have that many people that are willing to pony up the the funding for it. Um, so the timeline for commercialization, we're looking at about a year at the earliest for doing the uh, the optimization, the, the uh, manufacturability, uh, as well as getting into the the, the commercialization. Um, so about a year, year and a half, uh, we would say until we're ready for filing for regulatory. Can you reduce the cost around two dollars United States dollars? So right now it's five dollars. The vast majority of that cost actually is the expensive uh, enzymes that we use. So we, uh, you know, we, as we were developing the prototype, we weren't looking at you know cutting costs at all. We basically bought whatever we could to, just to get it to work, right? And so uh, I would say ninety-five percent of the cost, about four dollars. And 50 cents is all on enzymes. So these are enzymes, for example, the Cas12A enzyme that we buy, um, the RTRPA enzymes, all of that, you know, goes into that cost. And so if we did a lot of those enzymes in-house, um, we would probably be able to reduce it down to $2, uh, if not $1. What kind of regulatory restrictions would you need to abide by? So that is a great question. Um, it's a bit of a difficult question because nobody has uh, really developed um, a face mask based aerosol point of care detection system uh, that we know of. Um, we have seen things that are instrument based where it has a mass spec on the back end and you breathe into a tube uh, and that's kind of a whole wholly different animal. And so that's something we're actually trying to tease out right now. And I think we'll get a better idea um, once we kind of engage the FDA or any other regulatory bodies on what they need uh, for something like this to get approval. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is we're not sure right now. Um, but obviously clinical trials and demonstrating its effectiveness in uh, a real world, you know, field testing simulation, a real world field testing 
environment uh, is, is critical for that. Um, and right now we're taking baby steps. We just really need to, to get firm footing for the commercialization before we tackle anything else. And so that's where, you know, 100% of our effort is focused on right now uh, is seeing if whether or not we can make that threshold to make to uh, to kind of start a, uh, a company to commercialize this. All right, um, you guys have don't have any other questions. Uh, I'll let the um, uh, everyone move on to the next part of the, the talk. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much. Absolutely. That Thanks was an excellent you. talk. Yeah. All right. And then if we could just have Jerukumal return to the uh, stage. And then uh, I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. So that will be Brian us from University of Pittsburgh. So Brian, you can take it away. Can everyone hear me as well? Let me begin screen sharing and I shall start my talk. Okay, cool. Hello everyone. So my name is Brian Day. I'm a fifth year PhD student from the University of Pittsburgh um, in Chris Wilmer's lab. And today I'll be talking about the computational design of moth-based electronic noses for disease detection by breath. And so I'd like to actually start today's talk by going over a bit of how our um, breath works. So every day we take around 20,000 breaths, each with 500 milliliters, roughly in volume. So that's a lot of exhaled sample every single day, if we're thinking of breath as a sample. And in each one of these breaths, we exhale roughly 800 unique compounds. Um, and so that's more than are found in saliva, sweat, urine, or feces, um, making breath a really information-rich sample type. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these compounds are present in parts per million and all the way down to parts per trillion concentrations, which means detecting them can actually be quite difficult. Um, and then in relationship to disease state, um, when diseases affect our body, there's metabolic changes that um, in turn impact the concentration of a lot of these trace compounds which means that we can actually use breath as a screening and diagnostic platform as long as we know how these compounds are being changed. Um, on the flip side though, there are a lot of external factors that can also alter the composition of our breath and that includes things like diet, age, and then like importantly local air quality. Um, and on top of that, when we breathe, we don't get this perfectly uniformly mixed sample. We have this upper portion of our breath, which closely resembles the air around us as it's not like deeply inhaled. Um, and then conversely, this deeper breath where you get a lot of exchange of oxygen, CO2, and all of these other important volatiles is where we get this information rich breath. Um, and then in tandem with that, there's a lot of humidity in our breath and people have done a lot of interesting work with breath condensate for disease screening and detection applications. Um, but all of that is to say, while breath is a really interesting sample type, there's a lot of challenges that haven't really been dealt with for breath when trying to use the gas or volatile portions of it for disease detection purposes. Um, so having said that, there has still been a really impressive library of research on using breath for disease detection. We know that we can detect a bunch of different types of cancers with our breath, um, liver disease, kidney disease. There is even a test on the market for SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overload that is a breath-based test. Um, and more recently throughout the pandemic, people have realized that we can actually detect for COVID-19 using our breath and specifically the volatiles in our breath as well. Um, and so there's been studies done with dogs that actually sniff out coronavirus. And in the earliest phases of these studies, we didn't know what they were sniffing. Um, although now we've started to actually identify this, some of the key biomarkers for detecting coronavirus with your breath. Um, so having said all that, it kind of bears the question, like, why aren't there breath-based tests on the market yet? And a lot of it has to do with the current gas sensing technologies. So there's a number of impressive gas sensing technologies in terms of sensitivity and selectivity. And that includes things like gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. 
Um, but when we want to use these at a broad scale in a healthcare setting, there's a number of other features we need. So namely, we want to build a device that while achieving that sensitivity and selectivity is low cost, highly portable, has really quick response times, and arguably most importantly, has really simple operating conditions so that we can get these into the hands of nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors without the need for a lot of additional training. Um, and so what our lab believes is kind of the answer to this suite of features is a new type of gas sensor known as an electronic nose or an e-nose. And so what an e-nose is, um, or the goal of an e-nose, is essentially to mimic biological olfaction. So in our noses and in dogs' noses, there's hundreds of different types of olfactory receptors. And each of these receptors activates only in response to a certain set of molecules. And so rather than kind of having you know, one receptor per any type of molecule, what our noses and our brains do is actually consider the response of each of these receptors in a kind of complementary fashion. And it's able to use this, you know, all combinations of the activation of these receptors to distinguish between you know, hundreds of thousands of different types of smells. And so we basically wanna mimic this kind of cross-sensitive platform inside of a device. And so the goal here is that we're gonna build a sensing array, each of which uses a different material to achieve a similar degree of cross sensitivity. And so the materials that we're looking at to actually build this type of sensor array are what's known as metal organic frameworks or MOFs. And so as you can see here, MOFs are a class of highly diverse nanoporous crystalline materials. And they're diverse in both structural and chemical features. Um, and because of their nanoporous nature, they have really high internal surface areas. And so kind of all of these properties combine to give moths um, really, really impressive and equally diverse gas absorption properties. And so this kind of suite of diverse gas absorption properties makes moths these perfect cross-sensitive receptors for use in an electronic nose. Um, so what we wanted to do was build this sensor, right? But with, you know, hundreds of thousands of moths to choose from, hundreds of different gases in our breath, which moths to choose is a highly non-trivial problem. And so what we want to do is just consider all different sorts of combinations to figure out what sensor array is going to work best. And so when I say work best, let's start by considering some example problems. If I have a simple four-component gas mixture with gases A, B, C, and D, um, we can imagine in the true best case scenario, having actually a single sensor that has a unique response to all combinations of these four gases, but more likely than not, I would need um, close to four sensors with each being sensitive towards one and only one of these gases. So it becomes a really trivial problem to quantify the concentration of each of these gases. But this is obviously a simplification from what we're gonna see. Most often each of these MOFs is gonna be responsive towards a couple of these gases. But the idea still is that if we choose our sensing elements intelligently, we should actually be able to build a sensor which can determine the composition of this gas. Um, but this still is an oversimplification of the problem, right? I mentioned there's hundreds of different gases in our breath. And so you can imagine we start to get a problem that looks more like this, you know, way more than four gases. We're gonna need way more than four elements. We're not dealing with these binary yes, no responses. Um, and so I kind of show this slide not to say that this sensor array is exactly what you need, because it's not obvious to me, right, whether or not this sensor is sufficient for this 12 gas application. But what I really want to drive home is that this is as much of a big data problem as it is an engineering challenge. And so to address the big data portion of this sensor design problem, what our group does is use com um, computational methods. And so in the earliest phases of this work, what we did was we considered a three component gas mixture, just consisting of nitrogen, oxygen, and CO2. So effectively CO2 and air. And we considered the, uh, the concentration ranges shown here, and we did it in 1% spacing um, for a total of 961 compositions. And we wanted to build arrays from a subset of 50 moths. So using 50 moths for 961 compositions, we had to run a total of 48,000 GCMC simulations. Um, fortunately, with that type of simulation, this is a completely doable feat. Um, so we ran all of these simulations, and the result is effectively a library of simulated absorption data. Um, so basically, how much mass do these moths absorb as a function of the composition of the gas? 
And so what we could now do with this library of simulated absorption data was given a real sensor, we compare some detected mass to our simulated masses, and we actually convert a library of masses to a library of probabilities. And so we can do this for every single element in the gas sensing array, and then basically combine all of these probabilities to get a singular array probability that if the array is well designed actually resolves the composition of the or the prediction onto a single or small set of compositions as you see here. And so this was a really exciting initial work and then it demonstrated the concept but obviously a very far cry from the reality of you know the application. And there was also a couple of key bottlenecks with this previous approach. So as I mentioned before in this that study, we had to run 48,000 simulations, but if I wanted to double the number of MOFs to 100 and increase the resolution to half percent spacing, we'd be looking at just shy of 400,000 simulations. And to add only one additional gas brings us to just over 22 million simulations. And so you can imagine going to these highly multi-component gas mixtures and wanting to consider thousands of MOFs, that there was a scaling problem built into this that even the best supercomputers wouldn't be able to overcome. So what we needed to do was reevaluate how we kind of considered this problem. And so what we recognized was that we could use Henry's absorption constants so as I mentioned before, most of the gases in breath are present in trace quantities. And so when you get adsorption in a really low concentrations, you get the appearance of a Henry's adsorption regime, where the increase in the total adsorbed mass is linear with respect to the increase in concentration. And so we kind of reframed the problem and said in our breath, we have, you know, trace gases and non-trace gases. Um, and so we want to consider our absorbing material to be the MOF plus these non-trace gases and see how this new material absorbs these trace gases. And so that's exactly what we did. We broke the problem apart into trace and non-trace gases. Here are the non-trace gases being the nitrogen and oxygen. And then we could actually look at the trace gases one at a time rather than having to consider all these different combinations of them. But we could actually look at the combinations on like a mathematical basis, so long as all of the different trace gases simultaneously satisfy a dilute assumption. Um, and so this just lets us use these absorption coefficients multiplied by some known mole fraction, um, as well as a correction factor for the non-trace gases to determine the total absorbed mass in a MOF without actually needing an additional simulation. And so this simplified the problem dramatically, but it does um, impose two additional questions. What happens to these majority gas species as the trace gases are absorbed? And would the composition of the majority gas species impact the absorption of the trace gases? Because as I mentioned, by changing the composition of the majority gas species, we're effectively changing what we consider to be the absorbing material. And so to answer these questions, we first chose this, um, a disease detection application, specifically looking at chronic kidney disease, for which ammonia is a biomarker. And so we considered these simplified five component um, computational samples, which contained nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, argon, and importantly, ammonia, with the latter three gases being considered trace gas species. And so what we did was we evaluated, evaluated these Henry's absorption coefficients, um, technically a modified form of these Henry's absorption coefficients, which we can call combined linear absorption coefficients, for all three of these trace gases in all 50 MOFs. And what we also did to examine the impact of the majority gas species concentration was do these sets of simulations for ratios of 3 to 1, 4 to 1, and 5 to 1 nitrogen to oxygen. Um, in this work, fortunately, we saw no significant differences between nitrogen and oxygen, which meant we could actually treat them as a single species. But you can imagine that that's not universally true, and there might even be applications where we really want to go out of our way to seek MOFs that can differentiate between nitrogen and oxygen. Um, but effectively, we got the increase in the absorption as a function of the trace gas species. Here I'm showing you the increase in CO2 um, in the MOF HQ1. But what we also did was quantify the decrease in the amount of the majority gas species absorbed, again, as a function of the trace gas mole fraction. And so by adding these two values together, we get a change in the total absorbed mass as a function of trace gas species. 
Um, and this is really what's important to us, because although on a computer I can count the molecules by type, with a real sensor I obviously can't do that. And so you could imagine we could have scenarios in which we get a huge increase in CO2, but if we get an equal decrease in the nitrogen and oxygen, I actually get no net change in response, which is bad from a sensing perspective. Um, so now with this kind of library of combined linear absorption coefficients, we had to determine how we were going to actually predict a gas mixture um, or a gas composition given a set of detected outputs. And so we developed this algorithmic method for analyzing complex gas mixtures, and it works like this. We start with a set of points in composition space. Um, so this is just all possible compositions that we think the answer could be. And we assume that it encloses the correct answer. And then using these absorption coefficients, we convert from composition to mass space. And then just like before, we take our detected masses, we compare them to the predicted masses, and we move from mass into probability space, and we filter out the low probability compositions. And so this lets us kind of refine our prediction. But now, because we're using these absorption coefficients, we can actually do this in a continuous fashion. So what we can do is return to composition space, subdivide the grid around the remaining points of interest, again convert to mass space, again convert to probabilities, and then again filter out low probability points in an iterative fashion until we um, have a prediction that we are satisfied with. And so what this looks like for one of these simple five component samples is this. You get CO2 resolving relatively quickly as it's present in the highest concentration of all three trace gases and it's the most strongly absorbing, um, followed by argon, the second most um, concentrated gas. And then finally, though it takes quite a few cycles, we are actually able to predict parts per million levels of ammonia with these sensors. And so to test this at a broader scale, what we did was we created 50 healthy and 50 diseased simplified computational breath samples and we used what we determined to be the best five element array to actually analyze these samples. And so importantly, if you look at the two graphs on the right, you can see that we're able to predict the amount of ammonia in each of these samples with sufficient accuracy to differentiate between healthy and disease samples. Um, and so what we hope to do in the future is basically consider a lot of different biomarkers for a lot of different diseases, um, specifically lung cancer and hopefully coronavirus, to see kind of the limits of this methodology for designing moth-based sensor arrays. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you all and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm gonna go stop sharing. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much. That was an excellent talk, and I think it fits really well with uh, Peter's talk. Um, our first question is, how do you envision the applications of this technology? Yeah, so I didn't get too much into that, but the idea is that these sensors will respond relatively quickly. Um, I think the most conservative estimates would be an hour, but we expect, you know, really minute response times. So we do want to use this as like a point of care breath based diagnostic. Um, and as long as a disease has known biomarkers, we should be able to get to a point where we can design a sensor for it. Um, there are plenty of non disease detection applications as well, which we're also interested in exploring because at the end of the day, this is really kind of a platform for developing a gas sensor. Um, but currently we're focused on the disease detection applications. That's very exciting. Um, we have another question from Ali asking, in what platform did you perform the simulation of this device? Any specific software? Um, yeah, so we ran Grand Canonical Monte Carlo or GCMC simulations, and we specifically use the program RASPA, um, although there's a number of different GCMC programs. And I should mention, so what these simulations do for us is they just give in some crystal, so here the moth, predict the total absorbed mass. We're not actually simulating these um, a specific sensor type yet, but we do envision using surface acoustic wave or saw devices. And these effectively, there's like an additional step where you have to consider a voltage, but they're effectively very fancy scales. So we just use that raw mass data and kind of make the jump um, from mass data to sensing. That is, that is fascinating. 
Thank you so much for your presentation and for joining us today. We really appreciate it, Brian. Oh, thank you. Oh, um, before before you go, it looks like we have one more question. Uh, can we use this to mass detection, maybe an upgraded version possible for an airport? Um, so if I understand your question, just like any sort of mass-based detection, and the answer is yes, like these truly are just fancy scales, like I said. Um, we do need to know like how the gases absorb into this. It's not just like a universal concentration of the gases in the air. Depending on the pore size and the pore chemistry, some gases are 